Thank you so much. Um, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing? Great, good. It's good to see you. So I'm Macarena Gomez Valiz, or Maca. You can call me Maca. Um, I want to thank you all for being here, and I'm delighted to host this panel um, as part of Global South Center, co-hosting with Versa Books. This is actually the second event that we've done together. The first was on women of color perspectives on climate change, and I just saw Ashley Dawson come in the room, which was a part of a series that he and I put together as well. Tammy Navarro was there, and just Karen Dillon. I think that's archived online, as this one will be as well. So I'm thrilled about this panel this evening. Um, it comes out of a reading group that the four of us created with the same title, Anarchisms Otherwise. And over the past year, we've read inside and outside of the canon. We've read things like Rosa Luxemburg, Lucy Parsons, The Invisible Committee, the Flor Flores Magón brothers, each other's work, which has been really illuminating to think about anarchisms otherwise, the work of Shelley Street B, as well as Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed, and I believe that Jack will speak about that book tonight. So the prompt we have before us is really to think about the potential of anarchisms in continually troubled times, and what we can learn by focusing on something that we're calling anarchisms otherwise. By using the term otherwise, we're invoking very purposely black feminist, native feminist, queer, and decolonial perspectives whose resistance and refusal against power takes heterodox formats. Here we're really referring to individual and collective disturbances that do not make their way easily into the canon or into any genealogy of anarchisms or any particular left orthodoxy these manifestations are not always elevated to the event of, ma of a mass strike. And we were kind of joking on the way over here and wondering, you know, what kind of fell in and out of that canon and what would the challenges be with an engaged audience tonight about this, right? So, you know, they don't, they're not always elevated to the event of a mass strike, but they sometimes are. As each of our presenters show tonight, the social traits of anarchisms otherwise accrues it opposes, it disidentifies, to invoke the language of Munoz there, and it is both shaped by and defies the changing character of state and authorizing power. Since you can access the longer bios on the website, thank you, Anne, for reading mine, um, let me just do some brief introductions of our panelists, and then we'll have more time to engage after we give our presentations. And really, just to give a little bit of order um, to the disorder, I want to let you know that I will do a short presentation and then each of our panelists will follow and then we'll open up for comments, for engagement, for questions, for answers. We might gather some of those together, but we really want to engage you this evening. Our first presenter is Jaina Brown. She is professor of media studies in the department at Pratt Institute. Her, her areas of knowledge and interest include black expressive cultures, film, queer of color critique, anarchism, materialism, and science fiction. Her first book, which if you haven't read it, please do, is called Babylon Girls, Black Women Performers in the Shaping of the Modern, and it was published in 2008 by Duke University Press. Her new book is called Black Utopia, Speculative Life and the Music of Other Worlds, and that is forthcoming from Duke University Press. It traces black radical utopian practices and performances from the psychic travels of Sojourner Truth to the cosmic transmissions of Alice Coltrane and Sun Ra, and we're all eagerly awaiting this book. After Jaina is Jack Halberstam, professor of gender studies and English at Columbia University. Halberstam is the author of six books, including Female Masculinity, also Duke University Press, lots of shouts out to Duke tonight, to Ken Whisaker, The Queer Art of Failure, published by Duke 2011, Gaga Feminisms, etc., and most recently, a short book titled Trans Asterisk, A Quick and Quirky Account of Gender Variance, and that's by UC Press. Halberstam is currently working on many projects, uh, but one of them is an in-progress book that I think we'll hear a little piece of tonight entitled Wild Thing, Queer Theory After Nature, and that's also published with Duke. 
And we're thrilled also to have Saidia Hartman, Hartman join us this evening. Uh, she's here for a few days in between stops on her book tour, so it's a real privilege and honor to have her here. Saidia Hartman is the author of Scenes of Subjection, Terror, Slavery, and Self-Making in 19th Century Am Am America. Why not? Um, uh, that was published in 1997. A couple of years ago, there was a really important conference, Scenes uh, at 20 at Rutgers, based on the book. Uh, she's also author of Lose Your Mother, A Journey Along the Atlantic Slave Route, uh, published by Ferrer Strauss and Giraud, 2007. And of course, the new book that uh, you must purchase this evening, somehow, somewhere, called Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, and that's Norton Press, 2019. She's also at work on a new project, and Folio, an essay on narrative in the archive, and her work has been published in Callaloo, South Atlantic Quarterly, Brick, The New Yorker, and The Paris Review. She's a Guggenheim Fellow uh, this year. You wouldn't know it. She seems like she's everywhere. There's not a lot of leave time, I notice, uh, and professor of Columbia University. So please join me in welcoming our panelists tonight. <laughs> that to build out some of the vocabulary for this evening, there'll be some terms that we're going to use, right? So Jaina's keywords tonight are non-compliance, refusal, and disruption. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Jack's key words are destitution, dispossession, and destruction. A lot of D words. And Saidiya's terms are strike, riot, and mutual aid, OK? So um, to awkwardly transition into my own presentation, my key word for the presentation is indigenous anarcho-feminist critique. I have one, because it's long. <laughs> indigenous anarcho-feminist critique. So my research really focuses on the Americas, and doing this work, I've been made aware uh, of the post-colonial insight that writing and teaching about submerged perspectives from El Sur, or the South in English, and in the US Academy, is actually nearly impossible. It requires epistemic disobedience, okay? So as a non-indigenous Chilean political exile living as a settler in the Brooklyn upon uh, Lenape territories in the heart of gentrified displacement of the black diaspora that is Crown Heights, not to mention living in the belly of the beast that is US empire, I am compelled to center coloniality. As Rebecca Garrison writes about in her dissertation, our analysis and activisms require a settler responsibility. Yet it's precisely these imperial and colonial conditions that are too often included in the anarchist archive. How does the narrative then of anarchism, often a code for occidental or western forms of social organizing, hide female, indigenous, and Afro-descended people's modes of producing social life? How does anarchism's otherwise de-link from European historiography to instead center for, from the indigenous global south? So when working class women, black and indigenous women, entered the labor market in vast numbers during industrialization, they organized to improve their material and labor conditions. And this is something that Lourdes Savala details in her study on Mineras, Cholas, y Feministas, or Miners, Cholas, and Feminists. During the 20th century, anarchism actually became the route for many kinds of indigenous labor movements in the Andes. As women organized with men to achieve the eight-hour workday, to liberate prisoners, and to improve wages, they also developed a specifically anti-state and feminist agenda. Indeed, the story of female indigenous political visibility during Bolivian modernity is one that emerges in fits and starts and has to be carefully uncovered through the history of powerful indigenous female figures on the one hand and the more hidden histories of anar and anarchism on the other. So during capitalist expansion then, we know the story of rural to urban migration and how it produces this dramatic labor and racial segmentation. But throughout, Chola women, Chola market women, increase their participation through commercial exchanges as powerful and visible figures that organized and sold and bar bartered through systems that were not always legible to capitalism. 
And the reason I'm telling you this story is because we often think about the marketplace as always belonging to capitalism. What does it mean to think about this form of exchange that predates capitalism, which is you know, hard to imagine, but essentially about, I would suggest, a kind of post-extractive future. We can think about the market differently. Since the 1920s, Trollas intertwined, I think impressively, labor concerns with anti-racist work, with anti-state politics, with market organizing, and anti-discrimination efforts through embodied practice, right? As Lourdes de Savala details, Chola market women challenge upper class women on issues such as, as she says, quote, couple violence, the need for a new morality, the defense of free love, absolute divorce, and the rejection of civil marriage, end quote, towards instead what they call, call then a new feminist agenda. So this is a long history that I actually detail in my book, The Extractive Zone, but the important issue that I want to raise right now is the one of political exclusion and how feme female indigenous populations were deliberately and systematically excluded from the rights and privileges of the nation state. No news there, right? But let me give you an example. The 1952 socialist revolution led by the Movimiento Nacional Revolucionario that nationalized Bolivia's resource wealth did little to register significant levels of female membership. And though there's not a lot of this work translated, I highly recommend the work of Aymara scholar, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, many Silvias, but this is the Aymara Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, who has threaded together this history of anarchism, how it was contained, how it was obscured by both a leftist Marxist hegemony on the one hand and a state-centric revolutionary process on the other. So anarchist feminisms were essentially, right, this is the point I'm making, written out of leftist official history. As Aymara, as Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui names, this is, quote, an arco indigenismo, feminismo, because the chola figure, the women, the female fighter, the female organizer, are all part of this kind of rich vernacular of Andean social life. These are laboring figures, then, and they name a kind of less noted genealogy of what is otherwise described in decolonial scholarship as a permanent area or region of insurrection. So here I want to kind of call forth the black radical tradition and think if we can name traditions around the globe that maybe have that kind of um, inspiration, right? A kind of Andean radical tradition of permanent kind of instability in the Americas. I also want to suggest there's a lesser known story here about mining and the way in which women and children have bolstered the work of a kind of mining family at home while slavering in slag piles recycling toxic materials of mining extraction. And there are thousands of these women and children who have worked as porters uh, within million top heap, uh, heaps of contaminated waste. So what do we do with that? How do we think about mining surplus in those kinds of roles? And this is precisely what uh, women did and came forward in the 1960s and 1970s, realizing themselves as central agents, moving from the kind of secondary role that they played in the mining economy to realizing that they were central, right? And this is why I think the literature right now on social reproduction is so, so key to really think about the 80% of the workers in the globe that actually don't uh, function within the formal economy. So I also want to suggest that we have understudied something like the hunger strike, right? It becomes important as well because it renders women's social reproductive labor visible and I would argue seeks a kind of disobedient path to revolutionary activity. Uh, I love the term disobedient, so maybe that will also be one of my key words. So really to just sum up this genealogy, there's the Chola anarchist women before them, the poorly paid slag pile workers or Bairides, and all of this is opening up a certain kind of cartography of political visibility and a terrain of struggle into otherwise masculine geographies. So, to kind of fast forward from that point into the more recent past, I was really interested in doing work with a group called Mujeres Creando Comunidad. And you can look them up, they have these amazing kind of images and performances online, but they really have built on this history to construct a kind of an artist indigenous feminist uh, kind of genealogy. 
Ex Victoria Aldunate Morales describes what it means to do the daily work of anarchist feminisms as grounded in certain kinds of traditions. And she says this, quote, it is a collective experience. It is reasoning through the body. It is elaborating a never-ending flow of ideas, of concepts, of categories, of proposals, of images that gives a new vision to feminists. This requires opening one's eyes in ways that cannot be closed again, either from oneself or in relationship to the female eye." End quote. So rather than seeing this female eye as a kind of essentializing gesture right, of embodiment, I choose to see it as a way to think about and sense and live into the future through a kind of communal solidarity of the now. So building this feminismo comunitario, uh, you know, uh, Mujeres Creando uses graffitis or signature political quotes that are written in this beautiful cursive work on city walls to create an indigenous anarchist feminist imaginary of the urban space and not to mark a kind of capitalist interaction, or real estate speculation, or the building of new infrastructure, right, as a telltale signs of gentrification, but instead to instantiate the body through a, a kind of political improvisation of the written word. I love that. Um, my favorite memorable graffiti is, ni Dios, ni amo, ni marido, ni partido, mujeres creando. Not God, not boss, right, nor husband, nor par party, uh, women creating. So this is a sign with the female cross through with an A for anarchy at the end of the script. And I think what this does is kind of refuse heteronormativity. It refuses nationalism. It refuses national party politics. And instead offers this promise of an open invitation towards a kind of constructive future. So I just want to suggest that this kind of work is really about a direct critique and uh, also to lift up the work of the so-called feminist constitution that these women have uh, gathered. There's been much talk amongst the left, amongst those working in anarchist, anarchism about the possibility of a kind of uh, socialist nationalist project. Studying the Andes and seeing the ways in which people have come together through assemblies and really um, you know, thought about earth politics I'd like to suggest there's a lot that gets left out in that kind of project. So what is it that we have to do to continue to critique the nation state? Um, you know, 2011, the plurinational constitution by Evo Morales was a really important moment. There were important gains for multilingualism, for indigenous rights, for earth-centered rights. But if you go online and look at the feminist constitution written against the counterpart, you can find it online at the journal Hemisferica, um, you'll notice that really there's a push, pushing back. Uh, and the pushing back is what was left out was reproductive rights, feminist queer and trans rights, protections for sex workers and women and children working in the economies of social re reproduction. So all of this to me is really central and key. So in longer work, I really analyze the performance archive here. I don't have time for that today, and I want to give time, obviously, to all our panelists. But I do want to leave you with one thought. The anti-colonial, the anti-capitalist, and the anti-patriarchal, right? This is the triple threat analysis and world build building activity that I think is at the heart of something like indigenous, feminist, and artist critique. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Maka. Um, thank you, and thank you for emceeing tonight. Uh, thank you, Verso, for the space, and Anne for hosting. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to be in conversation with these amazing, amazing thinkers um, tonight. Um, so I am going to uh, read or share some of what I've been thinking um, and uh, looking forward to the conversation after. Okay. There's a reason that people don't invite me, come Oscar season, to their award ceremony parties. It's because I have a bad attitude. <laughs> when a black actor wins a statue, I don't experience the moment as one of triumph. I am not convinced that our presence at the table can mean much more than the celebration of the wealth of the few and the myth of meritocracy. 
I do appreciate a beautiful gown <laughs> and acknowledge that capitalism produces an extravagant and uncontrollable ex excess. But as Kropotkin argues in Mutual Aid, cooperation is as much a part of our survival as is comp comp competition. What if we gave it a try? I have the same bad attitude when I hear people getting enthused over the idea of Oprah becoming president. How would our world really change with another media module in the helm? I was truly swept up in the heady excitement of Obama's campaign and victory, but I knew I was partly voting for my fantasy and that this thin brown duke's real power lay in his ability to not only harness our adoration, but over $92 million to run his campaign. But I've never really felt the power of the vote in the US, and I have never felt represented. For many of the more radical black activists working in the mid 20th century, the struggle for the right to vote, uh, which we are still waging as black people, was not about belief in the electoral system or the constitution, but was an organizing strategy designed to encourage political literacy, to invigorate collective action, and to join black people from the northern states with those in the southern states in the fight against white supremacy. In 1965, SNCC activist Stokely Carmichael, AKA Kwame Ture, and his colleagues working in Alabama chose a Black Panther as the symbol for the Lowndes County Freedom Organization because it represented the need for power and access to resources. It did not stand as an appeal for legal redress. And we saw how protection under the social contract after yet another Civil Rights Act meant very little. But back to the Oscars and my bad attitude. <laughs> A frothy celebration ensued when Disney released a film version of the Marvel comic, Black Panther. Finally, a film that depicted us as glorious kings and queens engaged in epic battles between good and evil, right and wrong. I did not experience the joy people felt over, as some described it, seeing people on screen that looked like me. I find the burden of representation to have us all depicted as kings and queens quite boring. It just made me more aware of the dominance of normative and normativizing narratives, structures, and systems, the rules of visibility that obscure more than they show. Everyone was getting ready to move to Wakanda, forgetting that it had a closed door policy and it was not accepting immigrants or refugees. And anyway, perhaps most importantly, Wakanda is not a real place. <laughs> I don't think the lot at Disney Studios could hold us all. Representation, recognition by the state or any legitimating body is ultimately about institutional inclusion. Appeals for inclusion can become substitutes for substantive critiques of the dominant structures that actually depend on our exclusion. I don't believe our fight should be for recognition on the terms set by any industrial complex, entertainment or otherwise. Visibility means marketability, and the neoliberal market makes a profit branding selected language and iconography taken from more radical instantiations. In our current climate, branded personas and celebrity culture have become surrogates for a collective struggle for liberation. The much touted concepts of empowerment and autonomy have been bled of their political resonance, subsumed under the ethos of possessive individualism. In the context of high capitalism, play and pleasure are equated with privatized consumption and are drain of any communalist meaning. The idea of revolution, so crucial to a radical black politic, becomes a product rather than a practice a hollow posture rather than a situated provocation for the kinds of intense dialogue and contingent rapprochement we need around the, around the very concept, right? There's a conversation that needs to be had around, the con around what we mean by revolution. 
In my critique of representation, I join the indigenous scholar Glenn Coulthard in his anarchist critique of a Hegelian politics of mutual recognition and of looking to it as a model for freedom or self-fashioning. In this binary, the dominant and the dominated are locked in eternal struggle, only able to achieve subjectivity through the recognition of the other. To acknowledge that we are formed in relation is important, but there are other ways to think about recognition than in this masculinist and combative model. With Coltard, I suggest we should acknowledge and develop ways to recognize each other, to validate each other, and refuse the terms of legibility offered by dominant structures. As Jean-Luc Nancy says, we are singular plural, and we become with each other. My interest in, is in an anarchist impulse that refuses to be subsumed within the neoliberal market. This impulse exists and manifests in queer and quirky ways that disrupt the normative shape of things. It manifests in forms of performance and culture that grow in the cracks and fissures of capitalism's hegemonic project. Often forms are consumed as commodities, but other forms will always spring up in their place. Elsewhere, I have written about the anarcha-feminist film Born in Flames, which was uh, released in 1983. Has, have people seen that? How many, how many people, woo woo Okay. Um, it's whether or not I uh, include the spoiler. And I've been torn, I've been torn between whether to include the spoiler or not, so. Don't do it? Okay, all right. I'll say, I'll, I'll, I won't do the spoiler then, but you should all see, I'll see it, those of you who haven't seen it. Set in New York City, the film opens on an alternative universe in which there has been a socialist revolution in the US. But this revolution has not addressed the needs of poor women and women of color whose lives and well-being remain precarious. In response, a number of women found a revolutionary association called the Women's Army, organized as a system of affiliated cells, each working independently but in coordination with each other. Many women have been reluctant to work with the army, including those involved in the media, a group of white women journalists and two pirate DJs, Honey and Isabel, each with their own stations who feature prominently in the film. The soundtrack's incredible in this film. But after one of the members of the army is killed, women across the political and racial spectrum join forces. Yeah, it's okay. Do I need to be closer? Like that? Okay. Uh, where am I? Um, after their studios are bombed, DJs Honey and Isabel band together, steal U-Haul trucks, and set up their radio stations on the go. Partly a spoiler, I have to include it. The army then sees the means of media production, taking over the major radio and television stations at gunpoint. So, but I won't say the rest. There's more that happens. <laughs> oh. Well, they said they didn't want the spoilers. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's the best part. I, I want to know. Exactly. It's a moment. Yeah? Okay. All right. Born in Flames is an important film to revisit today as it invites us to rejuvenate a version of noncompliance that dances and screams and blows things up, that refuses, to, and, that refuses and disrupts rather than appeals. The film imagines the galvanizing of a radical ethos among working class and poor black women, women of color and white women, with lesbians as its central organizing intellectuals. It envisions the making of a counter public and its commons, formed through pirating the airwaves and by meeting women where they are in their daily lives. This is a counter public not herded into a single square, and a commons not necessarily under anything but held on a different bandwidth. The film celebrates a punk sensibility, and the process of making the film reflects its radical and collective politics. Borden, Borden filmed the footage of people, the film's made by a woman named Lizzie Borden, <laughs> yeah, um, filmed the footage of people in the streets by holding a camera out the window of her beat up car, for which she forged a fake filming pyramid. All the staged scenes were filmed either in her downstairs loft 
a downtown loft, or in people's apartments. Borden shot most of the footage of protests at actual demonstrations around New York City. There's a powerful porousness between the film's fiction, the concreteness of the city, and the realness of the participants' lives. The film is anarchistic in its politics. With its actors as participants in the film's conception, it insists on a non-hierarchical organizing principle. It is not interested in recognition, validation, or redress from the state or any existing institution. It does not search for protection under the social contract or for universal consensus. As DJ Honey says, revolutionary change demands that we, quote, deconstruct and reconstruct all the laws that suppress and oppress all of us. But the aim is not a revolution designed to create another nation state or another centralized form of governance. What the film ultimately asks us to understand is that revolutionary change is not a destination, but a practice. This practice is based in a continual questioning requiring that we defy and destabilize dominant paradigms and then that we sit in the ambiguity of not knowing what might be. Formal anarchism was famously and pejoratively referred to as utopian socialism by Frederick Engels, who called it reformist, as its vision of change was not based in the properly scientific process of historical materialism. What makes Born in Flames anarchist is that it refuses to offer any such formula or solution. It provokes, it stirs things up, it unsettles us. Born in Flames ends with, okay, this, I'm going to give you this much. Born in Flame ends with an explosion, the result of which we can only guess. But the film holds within it a utopian urge, a pulse, a rhythm that will not sync with any system uh, structure of dominance, system or structure of dominance. Its utopian impulse gestures not to a then and there, but a here and now we must all tune into. We live in a world of terror where policemen wrestle young women to the ground and gun us down. White supremacists march the streets, sanctioned by their elected leader who has occupied the White House. That is the dystopia of our present, our world on fire. Watching Born in Flames now, while it gives us no answers or blueprints, does incite us to make revolution real, to make it our daily practice, to struggle over what we want it to look and feel like. Activist Pat Parker said, revolution, it's not neat or pretty or quick. It is urgent that we take up the problems the film poses, how to participate in the formation of counterpublics, and what radical change means. The film demands that we wake up from uh, liberal dreams of meritocracy and the idea that the government and its contracts will or ever did protect us. Our actions, it suggests, should not be based in recognition from a nation state or in amassed wealth, but in remaining joyfully ungovernable. That mic? I'll try mine. Okay. All right. Good evening. How's everyone? Good. Um, this is really fun, actually, to be on this panel because, as Marcus said, we've had a, a reading group, and um, it's kind of cool to see what's come out of the reading group and put some of these ideas together uh, on this round table. So. What I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna do two things. One, I want to argue for the unmaking of everything. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, we know if we build on what Jaina just said, we, we can't trust in reform. We don't want to just change the system so that it allows for our admission to it. Um, I think looking around, this is a good moment for people to agree that what we need to do is not change the system, but unmake it. Hence, one of my words uh, is dereliction or destitution, but also destruction. And destruction comes from the Latin destruere, 
to unbuild. So I'm going to give you some examples in my remarks of unbuilding, creative uh, unbuilding. Um, but let me give you two quotes because the second part of the talk, I, want, I really do want to uh, follow the assignment I was given and talk about Ursula Le Guin. How many people have read The Dispossessed? See, a lot. Okay. Recently? Yeah, it's worth going back to it, actually. Uh, here are two quotes just to, you know, uh, wet the palate um, from Ursula Le Guin, The Dispossessed. One, to make a thief, make an owner. To create crime, create laws. Okay, make a thief, make an owner. To create crime, create laws. And this should lead us into the question of why we would destitute institutions. And then second, though, and this is on the topic of unbuilding. Those who build walls are their own prisoners. I'm gonna fulfill my proper function in the social organism. I am going to unbuild walls. Okay, so this is the unbuilding that I want to motion towards. One of the texts that we read early on is um, a manifesto by the French group, the Invisible Committee. It's called Now. And you could hear there's an interesting temporality to anarchism that seems to be the now. Um, and I'm going to move towards that in uh, my discussion of Ursula Le Guin. But in uh, the Invisible Committee's manifesto on Now, they're arguing that there's a there's a crisis in the present that mitigates towards uh, unmaking our world. And that means that we have to destitute the institutions that don't just rule us, but get in the way of us actually doing anything else, okay? So it's not just like, oh, we're being mismanaged or we don't wanna be ruled. It's that you can't even see what the alternative is because the institutions manage the future as much as they manage you know, what, what we think is happening uh, in the present. So just to give you a little example to, to get us going on destitution, here are some things we could destitute, and we'll see whether we're, we're okay with that. So uh, they argue, along with Moten and Harney, really, that we should destitute the university. And anyone who's been in the university recently will be like, absolutely, bring it down, right? <laughs> And they give us, an, as a sort of easy example of that, they say, um, because it's not hard to find more vibrant places where knowledge is being exchanged. And here we are. Hopefully this is more vibrant than the classroom you just left. Um, and they say, uh, this is, we, we have to get out of the university and into places where we will find the last vigorous minds who are tired of frequenting the academic zombies and who want to administer a death blow to them. So universities, as we've seen in recent weeks with all of the admissions scandals, are set up just to qualify a new generation of wealthy people for new protocols of rule, right? So the university, with its eye on the prize of the endowment, is not the place that we are going to uh, find or create or make alternatives. Uh, so if if that's not your bag, how about the judicial system? How about we destitute the judicial system? And they argue that the judicial system, as we know, has nothing to do with justice. It has only to do with protecting uh, the institutions that you know, sustain uh, the status quo. Um, uh, medicine. If you have been to the doctor recently, you know that you don't get healed at the doctors, you get pills. We basically have a system of legalized drug dealing uh, where your doctor is in the employ of a pharmaceutical company and gives you the brand of pills at of great, greatly inflated prices, right, that will get rid of your symptom but will not heal you. And I think that this uh, has something to do with why people are going back to the work of Silvia Federici right now is because we are interested in people who know other ways of healing that she identified as witchcraft, as a particular... Uh, tradition of knowing and being uh, engaged with people's bodies and the environment that had a different kind of knowledge than the knowledge that was being institutionalized as medicine. Uh, and then finally, to echo Jaina's final point, we must destitute the government. And destituting the government doesn't just mean, you, you know, like, uh, oh, let's get a better leader in there, right? Our government is the system 
is not Trump, is the system that delivered Trump and made it viable that Trump could even be a leader, okay? So if you're in a system that can find the worst person in the country in terms of leadership and deliver that person to you as your world leader, then that system must go. And I want to give you uh, an example of how you might derelict democracy, which is basically what we're calling for. Um, there was a um, fantastic black drag queen, um, and this is another lineage of knowledge, I would say. The black drag queen represents a particular lineage of knowledge. This black drag queen in particular, Joan Jett Black, um, ran a campaign in the 1990s. She ran for president. 1992, her slogan was, Lick Bush in 92. That sounded good. I don't know why people didn't go for that. Um, but when that didn't work, in 1996, she went on a completely different uh, tack. And she decided to become the presidential candidate for what Moten and Hani might call the collectivity of the unwilling. The collectivity of the unwilling is not a collectivity that needs to be created. It doesn't require a thinker to make it. The collectivity of the unwilling are the smart 56% of this country who do not vote. Now, it doesn't, they don't vote necessarily simply because they are agentic and decide not to vote. Many of those people cannot vote, right? They are in jail or they are the formerly incarcerated or they don't have enough polling centers in their uh, particularly underserved uh, neighborhoods or there are a million reasons, or they are undocumented, there are a million reasons that half of the population does not vote. Joan Jett Black says, I'm your candidate, don't vote for me, okay? So then she actually went, I mean, after sneaking into the Democratic National Convention in 1996 in boy drag, she then went into the bathroom, changed into female drag, and then out dragged everyone at that crazy pageant who thinks that they're doing drag. She out dragged them and then went to the Iowa primary and said, I am the candidate for the non-voting. At that point, she counted 440,000 votes in her favor and declared victory. <laughs> I think we should all run for president in the next election on behalf of the collectivity of the unwilling, the those who refuse to or cannot vote, uh, and who represent this critique of democracy, this dereliction uh, of democracy uh, that is saying something and is saying something by refusing to participate in the charade of representative democracy. One question that you might have about dereliction that I'm, I just want to sort of foreground is, in an era of epic homelessness, can we really use this term dereliction with any kind of you know, political integrity? Is that a reasonable thing to say? So I want to change the question of homelessness uh, uh, which would be one of the symbols of dereliction in the world that we live in. I want to change it around and remind us that we don't live in a world with a homeless problem. We live in a world with a problem of having people with too many homes, right? So the reason that some people are homeless is because other people at the top of the economic uh, sector are simply buying up all of those luxury buildings um, and not living in them, right? And Mark had pointed to me uh, a, an article a few weeks ago in the paper that said that some of those luxury buildings that are being built in uh, New York City, if they were fully occupied, they would collapse because they are not built to hold people. They are built to contain $34 million apartments that do not contain people, that nobody lives in. They are, as we know, that they're only investment opportunities, but what we don't know is that they are built in complete, it's not even like the wealthier building, their fantasy uh, apartment, they're not. It's just a completely empty gesture. And that then creates, pulls up the whole housing market to the point that everyone at the bottom end of the housing market uh, is rendered homeless. So if we changed it around and recognized that we have a home full problem, only then maybe would we agree that what we need to do is unbuild. We need to unbuild this real estate cycle. And I want to give you uh, an example of somebody who tried to do that at the very beginning of this cycle of real estate speculation. And this is uh, an artist that I've been writing about a little bit, Gordon Matter Clark who is enjoying a big revival. He is the an architecture guy, uh, and he brought together architecture and anarchy 
to think about what it would mean to go get an architecture degree, which he did, and then use it to figure out architecturally how to unbuild everything. And there are a couple of different things that he did. I'll only tell you about one of them. One of them was a project called Fake Estates. Fake Estates. And in 1975, he purchased 13 parcels of land in Queens uh, that had been deemed gutter space or curb property. They cost $25 each. Now, anytime people buy a little plot of land, there are bits of that land that they don't buy. And it might be for any number of reasons. You can hear it, curb property, uh, gutter space. And he made it his mission to buy as many of these lots as he could, with the only proviso being that they be uninhabitable. So you start chipping away at the real estate terrain as it begin, and this is in 1975. He could already see that this moment of speculation was beginning to run through the real estate market, and he did this both as a gesture, but also to suggest that we kind of have to buy up and then de-occupy little tiny parcels of land and sort of chip away uh, at this, what would you call it, economic sovereignty uh, and the speculative intention uh, of the real estate market. So this is the moment, it seems to me, to go back to an architecture and think about how to unbuild the world and then think about living otherwise. So that could be a topic of conversation for us, how to cohabit, co how to create spaces that aren't massively expensive but that allow for lots of different people uh, to live together in uh, cooperation. Okay, so that's my, hopefully somebody's on board with dereliction, we'll find out. Um, the second concept then is dispossession. And I just wanna take you back really to Ursula Le Guin who was writing her uto ambiguous utopian novels, The Left Hand of Darkness and The Dispossessed, at exactly the same time as Gordon Matt Clark began his Fake Estates projects. 1974 is the year of an architecture and uh, Ursula Le Guin's anarchist utopias. What's so interesting, right, looking back at Ursula Le Guin is how very few people have even tried an anarchist utopia. It seems unthinkable. We, we have all kinds of utopia. We have all kinds of alien utopias. We have lots and lots of dystopias. But there are very, very few, hardly any, anarchist utopias. And Ursula Le Guin is super interesting for having given us two, not just one, uh, but two of them, in which part of the utopian rendering of anarchy involves sexual and gender otherness. And I think that comes out uh, very clearly, very vividly in The Left Hand of Darkness, but it's also available in The Dispossessed, where Shevik, a sort of uh, time traveler from the anarchist planet of Anaris, goes to Eurus um, and finds that this archist planet has, for example, no use for women in the workplace, and he's like, this is insane. Why are women sequestered uh, in, in the home? So there is, there's a clear feminist politics in the dispossessed, and there's a sexual politics in the left hand uh, of darkness. Um, but uh, the, one of the things that makes these utopian novels actually work is not because they're perfect, but because they're not because there are problems. And some of the problems, just, well, what are the problems with an anarchist society? Well, some of them are about the difficulties of sharing, um, the erotic blandness of androgyny, I, I, and I say that tentatively, knowing that non-binary is a big project right now, but honestly, that's one of the things that uh, Anaris is sort of accused of, is draining the eros out of difference itself. And so I'm, I'm interested in that. What's a sexy anarchist utopia? I feel like that's a very big problem. I'm hoping we'll solve it tonight. Um, <laughs> um, but then the final problem is that the anarchist society doesn't seem to have a place for artists, for people who think differently. There's a kind of emphasis on uniformity that is both an erotic problem and a problem when it comes to the creation of art. So I want to tell you, I'll, I'll tell you how we get around that uh, in a moment. But Shevik is our main character, just to remind you, set the scene. He goes to uh, Aris? What was the name Aris. of the... Eurus? Eurus. Eurus. He goes to Eurus because there are better resources there to work on his unified theory of time.
time which the Arctic society wants to capitalize and wants to turn into a consumer product. Um, but he's working on simultaneity for other reasons that might have to do with something that we can still sort of recognize as revolution. By the end of his trip, Shevik has joined a revolutionary cell. He has opposed Eurus's demand to own his intellectual labor, and he has given a speech on freedom to the protesters who've gathered in Capitol Square. In his speech, Shevik likens freedom to the relinquishing of the will to own. And there are echoes of this in Saidiya's book, and I, so I want to read you a little piece of the speech. He says, he gives this speech in Capitol Square as people are rising up against the archists. He says, we know there is no help for us but from one another, that no hand will save us if we do not reach out our hand, and, the hand, and that the hand you reach out is as empty as mine. You have nothing, you possess nothing, you own nothing, therefore you are free. Okay, so freedom is freedom from ownership. All you have is what you are and what you give. And therefore his slogan is not to make the revolution, but to be the revolution. And the only way to be the revolution is to give up on possession, hence dispossession. So in this speech, he lays out the principles of dispossession that involved a debt that is only to each other. And here again, you can hear the echoes of that. In Moten and Hani's, we owe each other everything. And the, the lengthy elaboration of debt in that text as something that is not owed to a bank, is not owed to, on a credit card. Debt is something that we only owe to each other. It's the only debt that should be uh, paid. Um, a principle of mutual aid, uh, which is about sharing rather than owning, something that we have literally forgotten how to do, um, and an orientation towards dispossession that requires that we destitute everything that makes up this entity of uh, capitalism. All right. Um, so let me, uh, I have just a couple more comments. Simultaneity. Why simultaneity? The theory that Shevik pursues in The Dispossessed is one of simultaneity. And this is the theory within which the future can coexist with the past. In fact, the way he puts it is that the future is in solidarity with the past and with the present. And this, what does this do? It removes notions of cause and effect or progress and then allows for the simultaneous uh, holding of disparate beliefs, contradiction, uh, in other words, disharmony, the working together of many people independently and separately. And this is what's going to resolve the problem of the lack of the artist in the anarchist society. It also allows for a disunified notion of self. And this is where I think the queerness comes into play. You could think about it as resolving some of the issues that we see in trans lives, for example. You can say within a theory of simultaneity, I was a girl, I am a man. And both can be true, right? So that we can, we can resolve to live with a completely uh, disunified understanding of self and the subject, which doesn't go through post-structuralism, goes through this theory of simultaneity. Um, so what simultaneity allows, and this is moving towards my conclusion and names in some way then, is the queer potential of anarchy, a potential that is easily muffled by the mechanisms of, in the book of work, family, intimacy, and so on, that smuggle normativity and conformity back into even revolutionary arrangements of life. It is on a par with the notion of spontaneous revolution, which our group realized Luxembourg raised only to dismiss, and I think we want to go back to it and think about how particularly in an online world, maybe only spontaneous revolution can actually work, where we all, I don't know, got off Twitter all at the same time, you know, something like that, that you, you bring something down by disinvesting in it like that all at once. Um, rejected by Luxembourg and other market, Marxists in favor of historical determinism, but a spontaneity and a simultaneity that are appealing anew. And let me give you a, uh, um, an example of that from uh, Saidiya's book by way of passing the mic. Anarchy, uh, as Saidiya Hartman's work on waywardness shows, 
is not always a deliberate political program that has been laid out with principles and then followed by revolutionary subjects. It can also be a shared set of desires, orientations, wayward motions, refusals, and modes of assembly. And the revolutionary subject in wayward lives is the assembly or the chorus of black girls who simultaneously uh, refuse the form of life that is being offered to them uh, via capitalism. Anarchy in that book is embedded as much as in what she calls the erotic life of the ungovernable as it is in the rebellion staged by young black women in prison. Riot appears in song, in gatherings, in clubs at night, in the temporality of lingering or strolling and the willful search for pleasure. And violence for the chorus, as Hartman names the black revolutionary subjects, is not a chosen path. It is simply an unavoidable set of actions against the state, the prison guards, the white employers, predatory white men, managerial white women, and so on. You don't have to choose violence or not choose it. You simply have to go through it in order for destitution uh, to occur. And so in Wayward Lives, black women long often and together to smash things up and to persist in open rebellion, and they do so in simultaneous revolt against a continuous time of slavery. So to conclude then, in the spirit of simultaneity offered by Shevik in The Dispossessed, I suggest to echo both Marka and Jaina's calls, we move towards the now of the Invisible Committee, the simultaneous temporality of the dispossessed, the communal solidarity that uh, Marka talked about, the spontaneous movement of the chorus in uh, Saidiya's book, and we trash the polemic of no future in favor of a world within which we say, we want the future and we want it now. Thank you. This is, uh, this is great. I'm just gonna open with a few remarks that um, echo um, some of the things that have been said, and then I'm going to read um, a short uh, section from Riot and Refrain, which I was thinking of very much today as the music of the here and now. So, um, but I guess, you know, one of the things that I was, you know, thinking about really over the course of my work um, is, you know, seeking an imagination of freedom and autonomy that is outside the state and exceeds the subject. Really, since scenes I've been thinking about um, that project and to, you know, echo Jaina's, you know, kind of eviscerating read of um, uh, Black Panther and, you know, Wakanda as the vision of Black monarchy. Right, um, it's still monarchy, and um, and I was thinking that you know, one of the things is that you know, a, an imagination that doesn't desire those legible forms falls out both because of the stranglehold of kind of Western conceptions of the political, but also because it becomes hard to imagine something that is otherwise. And in Lose Your Mother even as the first pages were like, this is not about a roots narrative, this is not a narrative of kind of ethnic recovery, this is not a longing to belong in the context of the great states, but really to reckon with the lives undone and obliterated in the making of human commodities. And the book is about the role of these kind of predatory state formations in making possible those human commodities. And, you know, the last chapter, Fugitive Dreams, I think really is when um, the seed was planted for me in terms of thinking about, oh, black anarchy, what is this vision of autonomy that doesn't have as its um, telos the notion of, you know, a White House, even if it is in Harlem, right? That's thinking outside the terrain of a kind of like a nationalist, liberatory, um, project and really that was through thinking about the example of the multiplicity of stateless societies and decentered social formations which have actually proliferated right in the history of the human so the state is this you know imposed form so that even when we have imaginations that um, you know 
express themselves along other tracks, they get reframed um, you know, in that language of state, national belonging. Um, so I, I wanted to, to say that, to think about the ways in which I really um, take up black anarchy um, in wayward lives. And um, like Maka's work, I mean, there have been, you know, centuries of like struggle against the state form that are organic and indigenous to black political and social practice. Yet when we think about like anti-state imaginaries, anti-state practices, vision of autonomous communities, we rarely take um, these practices, these lives, these histories um, into account. And one of the things that I wanted to do was really to describe um, certain practices and conceptions, certain imaginaries of freedom and autonomy um, that really echo some of the central tenets of what we think of as kind of anarchist practice. One is the kind of prefigurative politics of the now, trying to create the society we want to live, not in the future, right now, not having that channel through appeals for recognition or redress through these um, state forms. Another part of um, uh, vocabulary of anarchy for me that's really important is thinking about things like beauty and love, mm. right? And really thinking about the importance of beauty and love, particularly um, as a way of, you know, addressing and um, redressing the kind of the way capitalism, racial capitalism, makes our lives you know, disposable and devalued, but particularly in terms of addressing anti-blackness, right? Mm -hmm. And so that there were um, a set of terms that constellate for me in this project around love and anarchy, and that is, you know, to care for the unloved, to love what is not loved, to love freely, um, naming that as an anarchist practice, uh, naming, um, making a beautiful life as something that's really been critical and even, you know, kind of like 19th century anarchists would talk about, you know, we are beautiful now, that this becoming is unfolding in the present, that we make um, that beauty, that we recognize that beauty uh, in one another through this collective process of um, becoming. And one thing that, you know, I discovered um, in Lose Your Mother is the name of many of these kind of decentered, stateless formations. They had terms of self-naming that one was Sisala, which just means we who become together. That's not, you know, the history of like an ethnicized formation. That's about a becoming together. So I just it's another way of saying that these, you know, that there have always been multiple practices of anarchy. And, uh, and uh, I mean, the art of not being governed, right? Um, one of those things, you know, I mean, Jack mentioned the complete program for disorder. Um, you know, while describing anarchy as simply disorder has been a disparagement, it's also something that we embrace. I mean, Fanon described decolonization as a complete program for disorder. Um, even, uh, you know, Martin Luther King um, was saying, you know, we need not adjust to these racist social formations. And he imagined, you know, uh, he said an international uh, organization for creative maladjustment. You know, that, that's a kind of a collectivity which is not about um, falling uh, into line with the given. And so on that, I think I, I just want to then maybe read uh, a little um, section uh, from Riot and Refrain um, and um, to echo Jack and Maka and Jaina, I mean, I think across the panelists we have this vision of 
the outstretched hand, which may appear empty, but which has like so many gifts to offer. And that's also a phrase that recurs throughout this, that all we have is what she offers in her outstretched hand. And um, you know, as a hand of a domestic or the poor, the dispossessed, we assume that there's nothing there, but there's so much communal wealth um, within that social formation. So um, I'll just read uh, a little section about um, you know the beauty of riotous sounds, um, and this is about. Uh, a riot which takes place in a quote unquote reformatory, uh, a prison for young women in 1917. And I'm trying to think about the social experiment that happens in, even in the context of enclosure and that the way the riot is itself an extension of what Du Bois describes as the general strike, the general strike against the plantation and the way that strike extends itself into the city. Um, because we also read Luxembourg on the mass strike, we also know that the, the strike is something that um, can occur over decades. And, I, and that's one of the things that I'm actually describing in looking at this new, um, this emergent racial formation in the North, thinking about the general strike as a way of um, fighting against the enclosure. It was the dangerous music of open rebellion En masse, they announce what had been endured, what they wanted, what they intended to destroy. Bawling, screaming, cursing, and stomping made the cottage tremble and corral them together into one large, pulsing formation, an ensemble reveling in the beauty of the strike. Young women hung out of the windows, crowded at the doors, and huddled on shared beds sounded a complete revolution, a break with the given, an undoing and remaking of values which call property and law and social order into crisis. They sought out of here, out of now, out of the cell, out of the whole. The call and the appeal transformed them from prisoners into strikers from faceless abstractions secured by a string of numbers affixed to a cotton jumper into a collective body, a riotous gathering, even if only for 13 hours. In the discordant assembly, they found a hearing in one another. The black noise emanating from Lowell Cottage expressed their rage and their longing. It made manifest the latent rebellion simmering beneath the surface of things. It provided the language in which they lamented their lot and what they called the injustice of their keepers at the top of their voices. Sonic upheaval was a tactic, a creative resource of the riot. In December and January and again in July, when a clash erupted in the laundry room between a group of mostly black girls, including their white friends and lovers, and a group of white girls who hated the nigger lovers as much as they hated the black girls. When the police and state troopers arrived, the battle shifted and the girls fought them. The state authorities and the journalists were eager to label the clash as a race riot, but even so, they described the sound of the struggle against the state in the terms of black music. To those outside the circle, it was a din without melody or center. The New York Times had trouble deciding which among the sensational headlines it should use for the article, so it went with three. Devil's chorus sung by girl rioters. Bedford hears mingle shrieks and squeals, suggesting inferno set to jazz. <laughs> Outbreak purely vocal. What exactly did Dante's inferno sound like when transposed into a jazz suite? For the reporters, jazz was a synonym for primal sound, unrestrained impulse, savage modernism. It was raw energy and excitement nonsense and jargon, empty talk, excess, carnal desire. It was slang for copulation and conjured social disorder and free love. Perhaps this was an oblique reference to the sexual dimension of the riot. 
improvisation, the aesthetic possibilities that resided in the unforeseen, collaboration in the space of enclosure, the secondary rhythms of social life capable of creating an opening where there was none, exceeded the interpretive grid of state authorities and the journalists. You can take my tie, you can take my collar, but I'll jazz you till you holler. Sonic tumult and upheaval, it was resistance as music, it was a noise strike. In the most basic sense, the sounds emanating from Lowell were the free music of those in captivity. The abolition philosophy expressed within the circle, the shout and speech song of struggle. If freedom and mutual creation characterized the music, it too defined the strike and riot waged by the prisoners of Lowell. The reformatory blues, a facile label coined by the daily papers to describe the collective refusal of prison conditions was Dante filtered through Ma Rainey and Buddy Bolden. The sonic upheaval echoed and sampled the long history of black sound, whoops and hollers, shrieks and squawks, sorrow songs and blues. The chants and cries escaped the confines of the prison, even if their bodies did not. Almost every window of the cottage was crowded with Negro women who were shouting, crying, and laughing hysterically. Few outside the circle understood the deep sources of this hue and cry. The aesthetic inheritance of jargon and nonsense was nothing if not a philosophy of freedom that reached back to slave songs and circle dances. The sonic gifts of struggle and flight, death and refusal became music or moaning or joyful noise or discordant sound. For those within this circle, every groan and cry, curse and shout insisted slavery time was over. They were tired of being abused and confined. They wanted to be free. Aaron had written almost those exact words in one of his letters. I tell you, Miss Cobb, it is no slave time with colored people now. So had Maddie's mother. All of them might well have shouted, no slave time now, abolition now. In the surreal utopian nonsense of it all, and at the heart of the riot was the anarchy of colored girls, treason en masse, tumult, gathering together, the mutual collaboration required to confront the prison authorities and the police, the willingness to lose oneself and become something greater, a chorus, swarm, ensemble, mutual aid society. In lieu of an explanation or an appeal, they shouted and screamed. How else were they to express the longing to be free? How else were they to make plain their refusal to be governed? It was the soundtrack to a history that hurt. Outsiders described the din as a swan song to signal that their defeat was certain and that they would return to their former state as prisoners without a voice in the world and to whom anything might be done. There was little that was mournful in the chants and curses, the hollers and squawks. The collective utterance was not a dirge as they crowded in the windows of the cottage, some hanging out and others peeking from the corners, the dangerous music of black life was unleashed from within the space of captivity. It was a raucous polyphonic utterance that sounded beautiful and terrible. Before the riot was quashed, its force touched everyone on the grounds of the prison and as far away as the tenements rented rooms and ramshackle lodging houses of Harlem, Brooklyn, White Plains, and Staten Island. The noise conveyed the defeat and aspiration, the beauty and wretchedness, which was otherwise inaudible to the ears of the world. It revealed a sensibility at odds with the institution's brutal realism. What accounts for the utopian impulse that enabled them to believe that anyone cared about what they had to say? What convinced them that the force of their collective utterance was capable of turning anything around? What urged them to create a reservoir of living within the prison's mandated death? What made them tireless? In January, the women confined in Rebecca Hall waged another noise strike 
Loretta Mitchie, and others who had testified against the prison authorities were among them. Prisoners began to jangle their cell doors, throw furniture against the walls, scream, sing, and use profanity. They yelled and wept. They carried on vocally. Those locked in the cells of the prison building carried on all night. All those listening on the outside could discern were gales of cat calls, hurricanes of screams, cyclones of rage, tornadoes of squeals. The sounds yielded to one hair-raising, ear-testing devil's chorus. Those inside the circle listened for the love and the disappointment, the longing and the outrage that fuel this collective utterance. They channel the fears and the hopes of the ones who love them, the bad dreams and the nightmares about the children stolen away by white men in the back of wagons or lost at sea. The refrains were redolent with all the lovely plans about what they would do once they were free. These sounds travel through the night air. Oh, what a rich set of provocations and presentations and vocabularies. And I'm noticing we have about half an hour to engage you all, but I think I wanted to kind of start us off by maybe just saying uh, one thing that I noticed, and you know, we can open up or you can respond as well. I mean, I think part of the, the work that we're doing together collectively is trying to figure out these vocabularies, you know, and some of the, those vocabularies are counterintuitive. Certainly when I hear terms like destitution, I was trained as a sociologist, that has a certain kind of logic in it. Dispossession and debt and those kinds of questions. And in Saidiya's work, we hear a fully realized language of the kind of other side of that, right? We hear um, the rich language of doing otherwise, being otherwise, making, experimenting, um, and I think it was present in Jane's work tonight, certainly, and I think Jack gave us that discussion. But to what, you know, what is the point where we divest in the very languages, right, of, of some of our training as well? Mm -hmm. um, and that, that came up for me in, in terms of the work that we're doing, citational practice, a certain kind of mode of doing. So I just wondered for you all how you contend with that in your work, because languaging was, a big part, I think, of what we did tonight in the work. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I mean, like you said, I think, you know, one of the words you used was experimentation, you know, and um, I mean, these are the words we have, so we, we play with them, we distort them, we mangle them, we play with them, um, you know, we change their meaning, um, you know, uh, so I don't think that there's necessarily a need to then build, you know, another sort of stable set. I think the approach to the use of language is, you know, the approach to sort of the use of this uh, of terminology is um, is as important as the words we use. Do you know you know what I'm saying? Like it's a sense of improvisation, a sense of um, uh, the dialogic, you know, because not, none of the words are going to be the right. They're not going to match somehow, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, someone asked me a great question, and it was kind of um, it was. Why do you quote the way you quote? <laughs> and I think that that kind of um, is a response to um, Maka's provocation that we think about um, not being trained to produce work in the ways we've been trained. And I think partly that's why I quote in the way I quote to try to you know, create um, conversations between, you know, Rosa Luxemburg and Emma Goldman and ordinary black girls in Harlem and to say, oh, they're thinking about the same things, even though the terms in which they express those 
critiques might be different. It's a shared project, so I would say that's one thing. And um, and we know that you know um, that trying to I, I feel produce work in these other ways is part of that program of like. Um, making destitution happen inside the university because, I mean, so much of the pushback I've gotten around this book is precisely um, from people who want to discipline my practice, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's about creating proper forms of knowledge in regard to proper subjects whose lives, you know, are owned or are owned by someone. So I think that there's a way that the work should also um, enact the forms of disturbance that it's trying yes. to describe. 